Okay, how are you guys? Doing fine? Okay, let's, let's then start. Um, my presentation is on enduring impact of civil resistance uh, on democratization and democratic sustainability. And I will look also at the Polish solidarity movement and its legacy to illustrate uh, that, that kind of impact. And I, I have a quote from Reverend Lawson uh, that was actually, um, uh, that we heard on, on Sunday, face evil without imitating it. And I thought that it's quite relevant to what I'm going to talk about. And it's relevant because I think that my presentation tries to answer why. Not so much why essentially it's not um, useful and from the strategic point of view advantages uh, to use um, violence in order to um, uh, undermine the power of your opponent, but actually why strategically it's important not to use violence if you think about the future. If you think about um, the order that will emerge after the struggle ends, after the struggle is successful. And by highlighting the case of solidarity movement, I will also try to answer the question how it was possible, in Polish case actually, to face evil without imitating it. So, um, there are a couple of empirical and, and, and analytical inquiries that I'm quite interested in regarding that subject. Um, the question that I'm kind of starting from is, uh, is there a link between the practice of civil resistance and the process of democratic outcome? And if indeed there is such, an, such a link, such a connection, well, how do we study that kind of impact of, of residual forces? And, um, and then this is naturally a more kind of analytical inquiry. And the empirical inquiry is, uh, what are exactly those, uh, those long-lasting uh, effects? Uh, how they are visible? What, what exactly they, um, uh, they, what kind of form they take? And, and the assumption of this, of this presentation is that indeed the practice of civil resistance impacts or influence the trajectories of how the country um, democratizes and achieves certain democratic sustainability. And um, when one analyzes this, this subject, again from, again from the more analytical point of view, one faces with, with a couple of challenges here. And the first one is um, more kind of the issue of causality, whether indeed civil resistance played a role in democratization of the country. Uh, and, and, and establishing the, the more kind of durable democracy. Or maybe there were other factors, no less important, no less significant, influencing that democratization. Uh, that's one kind of challenge. Another analytical, another analytical challenge is actually what kind of mechanisms were there or carriers by which civil resistance make that kind of impact. A uh, kind of analytical challenge is the dominance of um, different types of explanations that emphasize uh, structure or different type of agency. And they would emphasize, for example, in terms of studying democratization, such as um, social privileges, that there were not many social privileges, or there was not such a great political polar polarization in the country, that there was a certain economic development uh, in that country that facilitated democratization and then, then successful democratic sustainability. Uh, in terms of kind of agency focused analysis, we find a lot of studies that focus on uh, elites and uh, negotiations and bargaining between power holders that eventually led democratization and uh, were responsible for establishing uh, democracy in a given country. Okay, there are a couple of studies, probably two main studies that I know of that are somehow addressing the issue or that link the connection between the practice of civil resistance and democratic transformation. And the first one is uh, how freedom is won, and we have mentioned uh, the, the, the study here already. Uh, but um, just to emphasize a couple of things which I think haven't been yet um, talked about. So that study looked at the um, 67 transitions that took place in the last 33 years. Um, um, uh, they started from kind of 2005 and then um, going back after 33 years. They looked at 67 transitions and they determined that um, 50 out of the 67 transitions were, were the ones where the civil resistance was actually a significant uh, factor. 
And, um, and then they look at where those countries were in 2005. Uh, they look at the, uh, at the Freedom House Index and uh, determine that those countries that had top-down transition, kind of uh, implemented by power holders, uh, that uh, out of those 14 countries, two of those countries were right now free uh, in terms of civil liberties and, and political freedoms, which was around 40, 14%. Um, 50 countries that went from the bottom-up transition, according to the um, Freedom House Index, 32 of them actually were considered as being free. So you had this gap of 14% of those countries that went through the top-down transition uh, versus 64% for those which, which went through that bottom-up transition with the civil resistance as key element and right now being considered uh, democracy. Um, in addition to that, I came across uh, recently uh, uh, the study by John Statt in the Peace and Change, which was published actually in July 2000. 10, uh, where he introduces different control variables and is essentially confirming the study by, by Freedom House, but it's adding one more element to that. Actually, he is uh, suggesting that there is also correlation between economic growth and the presence of the strong civilian-based force before transition happened. And he says that in 50% of cases of the top-down of the top-down transitions actually resulted in moderate and high economic growth in 50% of cases versus 80% of cases for the bottom-up transitions. So he also sees the correlation not only between democracy and establishing democracy, but actual uh, economic prosperity in those countries that went through the uh, bottom-up transitions. There is a, a kind of a note of caution which one would need to make. Those 32 countries that are classified as being free, which went through the bottom-up transitions, actually almost half of those countries are located in one region, meaning Central Europe. About other fa factors that might have played a role in democratization in that part of the world. And uh, if one analyzes democratization in Central Eastern Europe, without, for example, considering the, uh, the factors such as European integration, one probably would miss a lot. However, this is just another question. It's not uh, probably disvaluing the argument that uh, democracies in those in this region might have actually brought, been brought about by by the existence of civil uh, civil resistance element. Okay, and then the second study. Uh, it's actually based on the forthcoming book uh, by Erika Chenoweth and uh, Maria Stefan, Why Civil Resistance Works and the Strategic Logic of uh, Nonviolent Resistance. Well, and what is relevant for our conversation here is that they were looking at uh, uh, 323 major nonviolent and violent conflicts. And uh, they actually picked up um, the most um, uh, difficult cases of those, of those conflicts because they looked at the, at the conflicts that um, uh, were the underlying um, um, kind of contention was uh, self-determination dictatorship and um, and uh, they look at the outcomes of those of those conflicts and um, they establish they look also at what happened with those countries that went through those type of conflicts uh, what kind of system emerged and they claim that they, uh, that um, based on the stati statistical analysis that prob probability that the country will be democracy five years after the successful nonviolent campaign is 51 percent versus 3% for the successful violent campaign. And then probability that the country will relapse into civil war after a successful civil resistance is 28% versus 43, almost well, twice as much, uh, for the violent campaign. So those statistical analyses are quite revealing. Now, um, my understanding of civil resistance is quite broad. Uh, I don't think or I don't want to reduce civil resistance to a kind of formulaic logic of tactics and strategies, uh, and um, which is you know, a kind of almost a, a physical contest between oppressed and oppressor. Actually, I view civil resistance uh, much broadly uh, as a 
kind of laboratory within which liberty and democracy is practiced as uh, almost a kind of equivalence of rule of law. It's the civil resistance for me, the healthy civil resistance is democracy in the making. And in that sense, uh, I view civil resistance as a set of interactions uh, between the people and as in institutions, institutions that um, are based on certain norms, certain values, um, and, um, and certain rules. And this kind of definition um, brought me quite close to the issue that I kind of bring into the analysis of the long-term impact of civil resistance, which is social capital. Um, if you look at the definition of social capital, it's very similar to the definition that I have, that I, I have just offered regarding civil resistance. Uh, if you look at the writing by Patnam, Coleman, Fukuyama, Bourdieu, they define social capital also as an institution and as an interaction. Uh, institution based on values, norms, principles, and interactions based on human relations. And I thought that uh, that may offer some kind of help for us in terms of trying to identify the carrier by which civil resistance may influence certain um, changes in the society and politics. So then, I, um, then when you go also into literature of social capital, uh, you see that, social, uh, that uh, essentially authors are talking about three types of social capital. Bonding social capital, when we get together with people like us, with people who have the same kind of minds, they come from the same social, economic environment. Um, then another kind of level of social capital is bridging social capital, where we, go, where we get involved with people who are not like us, who are different, and despite that difference, we get together. And finally, uh, some scholars talked about linking social capital. It's essentially interacting between, interaction between the people, uh, ordinary people, and, and those who are in power. And I thought that actually when we talk about civil resistance, we talk about all those forms of social capital that is emerging if we have, again, a healthy type of civil resistance, where we get together, uh, probably at the beginning, uh, um, with the people like us, but then we build coalitions, we get uh, together with the people who are not like us, and finally, we try to also reach out to people in the government, particularly if we, if we are aiming at, for example, shifting loyalties, and trying to negotiate and trying to convince those pillars of support to come to our side. So um, then I also wanted to see what else probably uh, social capital can offer to, to civil resistance and what kind of connections could be there. And I thought that um, there may be some relevance between civil resistance tactics, the tactics we use, and the size of social capital that could be generated through those tactics. And I distinguish two types of tactics that actually, well, it wasn't myself, there were others who came up uh, with this kind of distinction. It's tactics of commission and tactics of omission. Tactics of commission are those tactics that, or those acts that are done and they are considered unlawful or prohibited by the authorities. But nevertheless, the movement is executing those tactics. Tactics of omission are those tactics that, um, or those acts that um, uh, people do, but they are not considered by the government unlawful. So essentially, it's, it's mainly relying on not doing something that the government would expect people to do. So examples. Well, the acts of commission, strikes, demonstrations, building parallel alternative institutions, Acts of omission, meaning uh, not doing something that the government would expect us to do. Conscription or election boycotts, tax refusals, boycott of government controlled media, for example. And then, and then I thought that it would be useful to see what those tactics are generating in the context of social capital. And I thought that um, those tactics of commission, they usually would require uh, sizable collectives and, and more participation on the part of, of, of the collectives and, and denser kind of human interactions. They would also require uh, more and durable 
uh, and sustainable constructions or, or building institutions. And they would require usually more material resources and needed, needed and, 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 uh, and mobilized. Uh, acts of commission that could be implemented usually uh, by individuals, uh, they may not require so much uh, resources, both human and mater material, and um, they, will not, they may not require so much institu institutionalization. And, uh, and because they, may be implement, they could be implemented by individuals rather than in group, usually those inter human interactions would be um, thinner. So according to this kind of anal analysis, acts of commission would generate greater social capital and acts of, commission would, act, acts of omission would generate less of social capital. And if we consider that social capital is important for building democracy, well, one could argue, if naturally that kind of uh, um, rough or uh, simplified maybe analysis, is that the more the movement implements acts of commission, the greater probability for democracy to emerge after the successful nonviolent struggle. What kind of propitious social capital can civil resistance generate? And um, one probably can talk more about uh, different social capital that civil resistance can generate. I enumerated the ones that I thought were quite relevant for the Polish case study. Um, first of all, uh, civil resistance can generate social capital that is, uh, that is establishing a template for future power arrangements and the distribution of political power in the society. Uh, civil resistance can also generate a template for future institutionalized practices in civic realm. It could be essentially a grant for the emergence of civil society organizations and non-governmental organizations. And finally, um, or another template that civil resistance can generate is activism and economic entrepreneurship. And, um, and also it's establishing certain patterns of waging nonviolent struggle um, uh, in the society. In, in, uh, in the democratic setting. It can also, it also creates a certain behavioral pattern of moderation in political contention. And, and it's, it may generate the new, the new worldviews of the society which underwent civil resistance, which experienced civil resistance, and then democratization. Now, I would like to talk about the Polish case. Uh, this drawing uh, has been done in in 1980s, and it's a cardiogram of the of the Polish resistance. You see the you see that heart beating long before actual solidarity, um, and it's it's quite significant um, because you've got a couple of dates here, and. Um, uh, 56, I will, I will come back to 44, but 56, 68, 70, 76, 80. Uh, 80 was the beginning of the solidarity. Uh, 56, the workers went on protest. 68, intellectuals went on protest. 70, again workers. 76, again workers. There, is not there were not much coalition building, um, at least till the end of 60s. Uh, then there was a qualitative and quantitative change, which I will be talking about um, in the next slide. But what is here more important is that all those days, 56, 68, 70, 76, 80, represents nonviolent struggle. 44, it actually refers to the uh, uprising in Warsaw, very violent one, against German occupation, where 200,000 uh, uh, Poles were killed indirectly, um, maybe even un unintentionally by, by the author of that drawing, a suggestion that um, um, solidarity, despite its nonviolent character, had its roots in the Polish resistance to occupation, regardless of what kind of resistance we talked about, whether it's violent or nonviolent. And actually some argued that uh, militant nonviolent solidarity, that militant kind of uh, and, and, and brave part of, of, of of the nonviolent resistance was coming from the violent resistance. So it actually highlighted the pragmatic nature of nonviolent resistance in Poland, where people recognized that violence is useless. They didn't become, from one day to another, pacifists. On the contrary, they were strategists. They thought that you know, if they had weapons and they knew that they could get rid of communist government 
and 70,000 Soviet troops on the Polish soil, probably if they thought that they were successful, they would do that with arms. But they, they consider that as suicidal. So um, what happened in 1970s? That was a qualitative and quantitative change in terms of uh, nonviolent resistance that occurred in Poland. Um, there were, uh, first of all, uh, the, the, the strategy that changed was challenging the government without challenging it. Challenging government without directly going after government, which meant let's build underground society and let's free society from the control of the government without essentially challenging it, which required building alternative institutions and of alternative police underground. And there were social, economic, cultural, educational institutions built underground outside of the, of the uh, Communist Party. And um, there was, I've got one quote, excellent quote from the activist who was kind of talking about how this underground society looked like. And he wrote, the government controls empty shops, but not the market. Government controls employment, but not the means to livelihood. The state press, but not the publishing movement. It controls telephones and postal services, but not communication. It controls schools, but not education. And that's what happened. And um, there were a couple of catalytic events that brought together various groups. Um, intelligentsia, workers, workers, church, peasants, students. Um, one of those events was the killing of the 20-year-old student in 1977 that essentially led, galvanized the whole student population. It led to the establishment of the uh, Independent Student Association. And, um, and this, is, this is the photos from the funeral of the student. Um, there were also, coming back to the slide, um, there were also a number of um, institutions established. Uh, including Committee for the Defense of Workers, established by intellectuals to offer legal and financial assistance for the first time to the workers that in 1976 protested the economic, uh, uh, economic policies of the government. Uh, so you've got emergence of a number of institutions that brought together various groups. Uh, and for the first time, you had the emergence of the kind of coalition of different uh, societal uh, constituencies. And um, in, in 1978, you had a major event for Poles, which was the election of the, of the Pope. It was Polish Pope, the, the first non-Italian Pope since 16th century. So that was a big event. And the Pope traveled to Poland at the end of 70s. And you had the, the pictures of the, mass that were, uh, of the masses that were held in Warsaw and in Krakow. And um, what was important, what was, what happened during those masses was that uh, the people who were opposing the government, they knew who they were. When they said they, they knew that that was the government. That was those officials that, 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 that we know of, that we see on the TV. Uh, but they never kind of uh, imagined and, and never knew who us were until they saw themselves in those crowds. It was, um, those crowds were up to one million people. And what was even more important, that organization of those masses uh, was done by social activists. For the first time, despite the kind of public, uh, pro well, it wasn't as such a protest, but kind of uh, public going on the street, you haven't seen any security forces. There were no security forces nearby. And you could see only people. And there was kind of emotional bond being developed. And finally they realized, and that was at the end of 70s, who they were, I mean, who us meant for them. Now, uh, the rise of solidarity in 1918-81. Um, it, it started from uh, a kind of workers' movement, trade union, uh, and uh, with, a, with a simple strategy. We have to legalize free trade unions. 
We don't want to establish democracy in Poland at this moment. It's unrealistic. Again, 70,000 Soviet troops were in Poland. Poles remembered what happened in Hungary in 1956, in Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia in 68. So they also limited their demand consciously, strategically. Let's fight for um, free trade unions. Something that, for example, students in Tiananmen um, haven't done and paid the cost. If, and that's, you know, it's, uh, it's difficult to hypothesize, but if, this, if those students limited their demands to free student unions rather than democracy in China in the same way the workers did in Poland, we may have uh, had a different kind of outcome. So in September 1980, under the pressure of the, of the, uh, of the strikes, of the general strikes that, that, uh, uh, and protests that took place in August 1998, the government is actually agreeing to establish, for, for, to register uh, solidarity as a free trade union. 80% of the adult population of a country joined voluntarily a civic organization. You had 9, 10 million people. A number of those people belonged to the Communist Party. Actually, there was only two groups that couldn't have the trade unions, whether um, communist or, 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 or solidarity uh, trade union. There was police and soldiers. They couldn't have any unions. They couldn't belong to any unions. Otherwise, whether you belong to the state bureaucracy or, or uh, you worked in different state services, you could join Solidarity, and that's what people did. Uh, and then Communist Party also lost 2-3 million members. And that happened in the midst of the Communist rule. The Brezhnev was still alive, actually. So, um, so, the, so that Solidarity at that time was powerful. It could demand quite a lot at this moment. And they still limited their demand to free trade union. People are talking about, scholars are talking about self-limiting revolution in Poland. Because indeed, solidarity movement was self-limiting. And I think you, again, this is the, the judgment that, that each activist and movement uh, have to make. Even if you are powerful, how you strategize your next move might actually uh, uh, be the issue of death and life for you. And, and polls, some, I mean, some members of the Solidarity push for more, but the general feeling was that this is what we could, can achieve in given circumstances. But by that time, Solidarity was no longer a workers' movement. It was something else. So, uh, briefly about the phenomenon of Solidarity. Um, if you interview those people who joined Solidarity, they really did this kind of transcendental experience or electrifying experience for those people. Uh, being in the, in the crowd that greeted Paul or being in a part of those strikes and demonstrations. <coughs> and there was a sense that everyone has a kind of responsibility uh, for the movement. Everyone had the ownership. This, can you imagine 10 million, 10 million people kind of feeling that ownership for the movement? This is a, a tremendous force. Um, the movement at the same time was very decentralized. It relied on a number of uh, councils, citizens' councils, in different regions, in different kind of local communities. Uh, it had very kind of participatory and, and democratic decision-making process. Um, there was a combination and maybe at the same time uh, contradictions within solidarity, a emphasis on egalitarianism, on individualism, on solidarism. Uh, definitely solidarity movement had this kind of tradition of independence and, and, and liberation uh, kind of culture of resistance that, that was part of the, of the kind of Polish history. Uh, it had also very strongly internalized nonviolent discipline. There was one uh, element of solidarity, radical kind of element of, sol of solidarity that was called fighting solidarity. And at one moment, um, the member of this fighting solidarity was arrested one of the members, and was interrogated and gave, up, gave out a number of names uh, of the people who were part of that fighting solidarity, and those people were arrested. And then uh, I, I remember reading the colleagues uh, that were still uh, not in jail of this fighting solidarity, they were planning, uh, they were thinking what to do 
um, with this person who was giving, who started giving out the names under interrogation. And uh, they thought that, first of all, they will try to kidnap him from the prison. But then his punishment, and that's where this kind of uh, you know, uh, violent element of the fighting solidarity, com for solidarity comes, they said that for the punishment, we will lock him down in the basement, and for a month, we will not let him out, and he will need to print every day 1,000 leaflets. <laughs> and that will be our punishment for what he did. <laughs> you know, they, they didn't think about you know, taking a weapon and just killing the guy for betraying the movement. No. I mean, this is, and, and they were quite serious about that strategy. I mean, they never implemented because uh, they didn't collect enough dynamites to, to essentially to take over the prison and, and free him. Um, and, it is, and then another point of solidarity, which I think is, it's, it's um, no, no, they haven't implemented that, no, no. Uh, and another, I think, important um, uh, feature of the movement, and the movement, actually, it's not only solidarity, it's, it's this supreme confidence in ultimate victory. They, those people knew that they are on the right side of history. They didn't know when the struggle will finish. Actually, if you talk to those people in 80s, uh, at the beginning of 80s, despite their power in 1980, they would say, this is a generation-long struggle. Uh, it's most likely we will not see the outcome of our struggle. Maybe our children. That's what they strongly believe in. And still they were part of that movement. So there was a kind of, really, um, I would describe it as a supreme confidence in the ultimate victory. And I think that each, if you embark on, on, a, on a kind of nationwide struggle, you do need to have that kind of confidence and conviction in order to be victorious. I wanted to focus on the Valencia leadership. What do you see here? This is Lech Valencia, the leader of solidarity, powerful solidarity in 1980. Uh, how would you describe those images? The first one, he's doing this. Is the same? Everyone knows the meaning of that? No? Uh, this is... Say it on camera, Matze. <laughs> uh, this is a, it's called, what is it, good arm? Or is it in English, the translation? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's an impolite a gesture. gesture. It's like showing a finger. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? It, finger. Right. <laughs> but I think that in some cultures you don't have it. Some cultures you, it's quite popular. Actually, this gesture was done by a Polish sportsman during the Olympics in Moscow in 1980 when he won a gold medal and then after jumping uh, because he was the uh, it's called Paul Volt uh, when he jumped and he saw that yes he he, he managed to, to break this barrier that you know jump over the bar uh, he had this like 60,000 um, um, Russians or sitting on the on the in the stadium and he did like this for him for them <laughs> And that was, and it's called the Kozakevich gesture. His name is Kozakevich and a gesture. And that's why it's called the pole ball. The pole <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So Valenza here is showing the same thing that to communist Polish government and, and, and communist uh, or backers in, in Moscow, that gesture. Uh, and in the second, uh, in the second image, it's kind of, he had this characteristic, characteristic Right, so it's a kind of, uh, uh, you know, the muscles, victorious, but using his mustache. And the, the third one, it's a, uh, uh, it's, it's a Christmas time, 1981. This is actually the moment where the martial law was introduced, 13th of December, uh, just before Christmas. And this is the postcard sent to some people. Uh, and he is here, what is the word called? Caroling. Caroling. So, uh, so, but, but what those images, what kind of leadership it sh they, those images are showing? Is it a playful? playful? Uh-huh. Is it a charismatic? No. It's essentially, uh, all those uh, pictures were done by solidarity members. Uh, they intentionally de emphasized and caricatured Valencia. Why do you think they wanted to do that? 
bring in new people at the grassroots level? Exactly. He's an every man, every, 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 every man, right? He is one of us. He is no, not a superhero. It's not a caudillo of Cuba. Uh, you know, a Christ, Fidel Castro entering Havana as a kind of Christ, on the kind of vanguard, revolutionary vanguard. No, Valencia was presented completely differently. Uh -huh. I would just, just also maybe think of kind of a counterexample, which is that the Obama campaign, we got a lot of popular images that people with supporters would send us of Obama, but it was not like this. It was much more of the savior imagery. Mm -hmm. And this is something that in the campaign, I think even Obama was aware of and was very nervous about, because it's like, oh, here's the savior, now what's going to happen when he gets into power? To the expectation. Also, I assume it's a, a rejection or an inversion of the communist and fascist, but in this case, communist cult of personality. Exactly. Exactly. So he was everything but the reflection of the government he's trying to challenge. This is actually important, the image of the, of the leader uh, um, um, that was created by solidarity, because I would claim that it had an impact on what happened after the change was, uh, was, after the movement was successful, and how the political system in Poland was designed. Now, there are a number of tactics that you could see here that solidarity used. I mean, starting from the image of the solidarity, this is a, a, a genius invention, I think, a logo solidarity. What it represents, you've got Different fonts, they are quite disordered. The letters are leaning against each other, although they are not falling on one another. Uh, they are quite close to one another. What do you think that image of solidarity represents? The people. The people. Uh, in what situation? In a, like in a march, like shoulder to shoulder. In a march, in a strike. They are the people in a strike, represented by those fonts. Different, but close, intimately close. And you've got Polish flag, which represents the, uh, the movement that is nationwide. It's not restricted to any region. It's not restricted to any kind of community. And I think that how you brand your movement is very important. And that branding, you know, despite the fact that there were no technologies that are right now existing, where it was important was as important for solidarity as it is important right now, and then you had different tactics: uh, protests, funerals, uh, Catholic masses. Actually, during the Catholic masses, during sermons, some priests were uh, uh, reading Orwell 1984 <laughs> to the to the people who were attending those masses. Uh, there was Polish strike. Uh, it was in mine, uh, uh, mine shaft, uh, in, the, in the mines, uh, the strikers were essentially, they were not going up, they were staying in the mine shaft, you know, five kilometers underground and striking there. Do you think that the government could send the force <laughs> to disperse the people in, in those shafts? So that was the kind of Polish uh, strike. Civil disobedience and then, again, creation of this um, uh, underground society. Uh, cultural, social, cultural institutions, educational institutions, those impressive Samizdat culture, underground press, uh, that essentially uh, the distribution of that were in millions. There were only around 2,000 periodicals, but they were distributed in millions. And if you look at all those uh, tactics, most of them would fall under the category of acts of uh, commission that would generate, that would require more resources that would require more interactions between the pe people and more mobilization and, and participation. In 1981, the martial law is introduced. Um, around 3,000 members of Solidarity Movement are arrested and detained. Uh, but martial law doesn't really achieve uh, its goal, meaning crippling so Solidarity. It did undermine Solidarity, but Solidarity didn't disappear. Those members who were not arrested uh, they, they went, again, underground uh, because, again, solidarity was legal, so people kind of, um, they didn't hide before the martial law. With the mar introduction of martial law, solidarity went again underground. 
Uh, and uh, what happened between 1981 and 1989 was a stalemate. The government essentially knew that it cannot get rid of solidarity, and solidarity knew that it cannot really uh, uh, get rid of the government and, 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 uh, and challenge it effectively that it will collapse. So that actually, uh, in 1988, because of the deterioration of the economic situation, um, uh, there were a number of strikes. Again, uh, Valencia called uh, with, with, the, with the Solidarity leadership uh, for a general strike. And by that time, the communist uh, wing of moderators kind of emerged. And they said that the only way we can kind of uh, um, uh, address the stalemate and, and deal with the economic situation is actually to negotiate with Solidarity. So they agreed, both parties agreed on roundtable discussions. And it was much more easier to come to that point of roundtable discussions because solidarity was a nonviolent resistance. So this is the roundtable talks between February 6th, April 5th, that brought, um, this was the main table, 40 or 50 people. But in addition to that, there were a number of working groups in different rooms addressing economic, <laughs> social, political issues. And uh, the roundtable talks finished in April 5th with the agreement that, that would be, there would be a free election campaign to a parliament, a pacted parliament, uh, that, would, uh, that would be held in June of 1989. And that was, there, were, there were to be the first election, free election since 1945. So, it was really a, 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 a kind of uh, uh, transcendenting, again, experience. Uh, um, and that happened before any changes uh, that took place later in, in different countries at the end of that year. Where we see this kind of civil resistance capital emerging, first of all, the moderation as self-limitation, um, where essentially this kind of self-limitation that I spoke about brought about the roundtable discussion itself. And, uh, and if we look at self-organization, it was very much visible in, in those elections, in, which, which took place in June 19, 1989. And I think the best uh, uh, illustration of the self-organization of solidarity that used all its kind of activism and all its uh, 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 civic organizations that it built underground to lead very vibrant election campaign. And here's the poster, the main poster of that election. Uh, for those of you who are, who are from United States, they would, you would recognize Gary Cooper from the Western in the 50s, High Noon. So he comes to the town. So what, the, what do you see in that image? There's a new sheriff in town. There's a new sheriff in town, okay. Good. Star, he's got the little badge. Okay. Tell me what he what he Yeah, what he holds. <laughs> exactly. He comes in a non-violent manner to the town to make an order. He comes with the ballot box. Huh? He doesn't have a, you know, revolver. He comes with the ballot box to make change. And the elections were very successful for the solidarity. Uh, so that was one of the kind of uh, capital, uh, social capital that civil resistance generated that helped them to win the elections and, and helped them, first of all, to make that compromise in, in terms of roundtable. Another uh, capital, I think, that was generated for civil resistance is this individual empowerment and entrepreneurship, which there was, um, during the years of, of the resistance, the, uh, the emergence of the second economy, this kind of existence of the second economy where citizens were doing all those economic transactions outside of the site of the government, underground, uh, illustrated a, a kind of uh, desire for individuals, essentially to, to have economic freedoms. People were not only fighting for political freedoms, they were also fighting for economic freedoms. And that, I think, that kind of uh, struggle prepared them well to face with the economic transformation that took place in Poland. And actually, when you look at the support of the Polish society for the free market economic reforms in 1989-1990, despite the fact that that transition was very painful, those support remained on the level of six, six, 70 or 80 percent. 
Actually, the, the support for economic freedoms in Poland were so high that the government went so towards those free market economic reforms that Pol Poland, when it joined the EU in 2004, was regarded as the more liberal in its economic outlook than Germany or France uh, in terms of private privatization of, of different state companies. And I think that you can make a, 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 a link uh, between the type of social capital generated by civil resistance and the type of response of the Polish society to economic reforms at the beginning of the 90s. Uh, what happened in Poland between 1989 and 1992, in the three years after the transition, after the successful struggle? Uh, some scholars talk about so-called rebellious civil society in Poland. S civil society emerged very quickly, but it was rebellious. It was demonstrating and protesting during those economic reforms. Uh, it had actually, uh, Poland had the, no, the, the, uh, the greatest numbers of, the, the greater number of, uh, greatest number of protests among all uh, countries in Central and Eastern Europe during that time. However, those protests and demonstrations were moderate. They were non-violent. And they didn't really change the main directions of economic policies. But they were essentially uh, protesting uh, an outcome of certain policies and, uh, and, uh, uh, and they were picking up a specific policy rather than general framework of economic reforms. And what was probably good uh, about that rebellious civil society is its, is its existence, because that time still the political parties and interest groups were quite weak. So one could make an argument that actually uh, through those demonstrations and protests, this was one way to influence uh, the political changes in Poland because uh, the, the political parties were weak and interest groups were weak. And I don't have really time uh, to go through other capi social capitals, but uh, let's see. Um, the, dis the diffusion of political power. Um, here, immediately after taking power, after Solidarity to took power in 1989, it actually introduced uh, the governance reforms almost using the image of Solidarity, how Solidarity was governed. So it, it, uh, it pressed for decentralization of the country, establishing autonomous local uh, rural and, and, um, and urban communities or communes with uh, budgets, with its auto autonomous powers. Um, and, um, and actually, what was interesting that they set up a civic organization to manage that reform, a civic organization that would train officials, both political and, and, and civic, in running those communes. And that organization still exists and it has uh, a number of branches in, in different local uh, communities to train those public officials. And with the political empowerment, I just focus on the semi-presidential system. And I think this is the way Valencia was presented in that image. And this is the reflection of what kind of system we have in Poland. Uh, it's a semi-presidential so the, it reflects the kind of longing of Poles for, uh, for a leader, a single leader. However, that leader is very constrained. Uh, it's, uh, the power of the president uh, uh, is, is limited by the power of the government and the, the prime minister. So there is, uh, um, uh, naturally that may kind of create a, a certain political conflict between prime minister and, and president, but president is still popularly elected. And usually you don't find many systems where the president is popularly elected by the people and have limited powers. Usually you would expect presidential system, either like in, 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 U, in US or in France. In Poland, because of that tradition that was coming, I think, from solidarity of the leader that is still there, but with limited, uh, with, with kind of limited powers, um, this is kind of reflected in the political system that, uh, that Poland has. And I will stop here. <laughs> uh, and you can view the rest of the slides on Moodle and so thank you okay now the one thing that I don't know if um, how many of you have you know study a little bit of methodology is that I think what Mashi was trying to do is that when you have a large and quantitative study of you know 300 and some cases you can establish correlation between X and Y. 
So you have civil resistance, and then you have democracy, democratic transition. Well, but then the two things, two things can happen at the same time without any causation. So what he has been trying to do is to establish causation. And he does so by talking about how civil resistance can strengthen the civil society and enhance social capital. Now, that's a, it's a very safe bet because um, in political science and also a lot of these theories of, of um, democratic transition, civil society and social capital are pretty well established. So he's on very safe ground. I have nothing to say about that. So the only thing I want to say a little bit about is um, that he has this very short slide that talks about, you know, a note of caution that because a lot of the cases that actually have both civil resistance and successful democratic consolidation, they, they, a lot of these cases are in Central Europe. And therefore, it is possible that this causation can be explained by other factors. Now, I want to just highlight these other fa factors because they form the conditions that we've been talking about that you know some of you may have to deal with. Now, the one thing about the Polish case is, um, is there anything unique about the Polish case? What? Oh, <laughs> if you ask someone from Notre Dame, what do you think that they'll, they'll see? Yes, the church, the Catholic church, the Pope. So how many of you here um, feel that to some extent you're motivated by religion? Not a lot, okay. Um, the, now why I raise religion is because just think about a lot of these factors that we were talking about. Um, you need to have some kind of discipline. We need to have unity. We need to create space no matter how difficult the situation is, no matter how totalitarian the, the, the regime is. You try to expand the space. And then you know what happens when it comes to, you know, when the Pope, when, when the Polish Pope was elected and he visited Poland. And as Marcia was just saying, wow, all of a sudden, we know who we are and who they are. So the formation of identity um, is very important. And, the, and religion, actually, I think, plays a more important role that, we, often, that we, we realize. And then this morning, Jack was talking about the mind. Now, something we know is important, but how do we know it? How do you shape it? So to some extent, I think religion may also play uh, some role. And then recently, I've been thinking a lot about also the fact that in, in China, if I, earlier I said that, you know, I feel very pessimistic about the future of China. Mm -hmm. But if there's one thing that will make me still feel that, you know, there, is, there may be hope, it's because when you look around, when you ask friends, even if the people I ask themselves are not Christians, usually pro Protestants, they often can tell you that, oh, yeah, I have relatives, I have friends, I have classmates who are Protestants. And they don't really make the, make the distinction between Catholic and, and, and Protestants, but whatever, they say we're, we're Christian. And re recently, we've also been, yeah, I don't know how many of you read stories about China, but there are a lot of these rights defense lawyers. You, they make it to the news because they're arrested, they're harassed, they're tortured, they're expelled, whatever. But the funny thing is that a lot of them are Protestants. And then a lot of them have also taken on cases um, for free. So they, they are these pro bono lawyers, and they are willing to basically put their lives at risk. They are willing to um, take on cases without getting any pay. They, they, even when they're tortured, they actually can, can tolerate it, can stand it, and keep going. And now, um, when we look at theories of nonviolent resistance, we often look at pragmatic versus um, um, principled nonviolence. And earlier I asked actually Reverend Lawson to what extent religion was a factor in his own struggle. And he said, no, no, not very important. But um, what is interesting is, <laughs> oh, you did? <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, sorry, sorry, I misinterpreted you. But when I look at also, so when I look at Chinese, when I look at Tibetans who are very the Buddhist, um, and then earlier, in, when Janet was talking about the South African case, and she mentioned um, liberation theology and, and, and Anglican bishop, so religion seems to actually play a more important role that, that we normally give it credit for. Um, so I, to some extent, 
I just wonder, you know, what if we do a counterfactual? If we take the Catholic Church out of the Polish, Polish case, what would have happened? Um, and then another alternative, so religion is what is the first alternative explanation. The second one is a different kind of geopolitics that Bill Dins talked about yesterday. Um, Marshe was comparing Tiananmen and, and Poland, saying that to some extent the solidarity in the early 80s when they were first formed, they didn't ask for democracy. They just wanted to have the, you know, have the right to form an autonomous um, workers' organization, a, a workers' union. To, one thing that is actually, um, I don't know to what extent it is really studied in the literature very much, um, but some guy called Jeff Goodwin in his um, No Other Way Out, he mentions this. Remember that what happened, when, when was the round table um, held? 1989, and they were actually... The month. It was, it was um, April, well, till April. Right, and until the early, early April. And when did Hu Yaobang die in China? When did Hu Yaobang die? Mm -hmm. He died in 89, right? Yeah, in, in mid-April. Right. And then students began to pour into the street. Right. So to some extent, that I definitely agree with all the criticisms of that the students could have done a lot better. But well, it is important, and now especially we have Li Pan's diary. Yeah. Li Pan had decided that, you know, because one thing is that when we talk about, you know, solidarity succeeded. But what happened was that the very success of solidarity then formed a very deep impression on, on the, in the minds of Chinese leaders. My goodness, these students are organizing. Oh my goodness, the, the movement is expanding to workers and teachers and all these other people. They all want to form their own autonomous, whatever, student union, workers' union. We're going to see solidarity. And solidarity, what? It's going to mean regime collapse. We're all going to die, basically, for these Chinese leaders. So they had this fear of the Polish trajectory. Now, on the other hand, though, the Chinese solution and what, what Eastern Europeans at the time called the Chinese solution, sending tanks to kill, you know, to, to clear the Tiananmen Square, then in turn, to some extent, affect what happened in Eastern Europe after June 4th. That's, that's the issue I spoke with the spokesman of Solidarity, and he said that when they were negotiating with the government, they saw what was going on in Tiananmen Square, which motivated them even more to make a compromise with the government. Right. To push too hard. So the Chinese actually case was influencing what was going right. on to a certain extent. Right, so that this is a very important aspect of geopolitics. The success in Eastern Europe actually to some extent contributed to failure in China. Failure in China in turn contributed to success in Eastern Europe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then another thing is that the third category, well, sorry, I told you, you have no time to ask me questions. <laughs> And then the third category of explanation is sometimes maybe it's just contingency. The things just happen. For example, um, Gorbachev, the, again, the, role, the critical role of Gorbachev versus Deng Xiaoping. Mm -hmm. Gorbachev was just willing to negotiate. While it means pulling out of uh, Russian tr troops, pulling out of Eastern Europe, fine, I can live with that. But Deng Xiaoping was just not willing to, you know, open up negotiation, treating, treating all these workers and, and, and peasants and students on equal terms, no way. So I think this is an important um, contingent factor that we, you know, to some extent, activists can't really control. And then I don't know if um, Reverend Lawson heard about this story. Father Hesper at Notre Dame loves to tell this story a, a lot. He said that when he was serving on the Civil Rights Commission and he needed to get the, bill, the, the Civil Rights Bill passed, um, no, Johnson wanted to get the civil rights bill passed. And he actually also emphasized that Kennedy was in no way to get the bill passed be to some extent because he was just blocked by all these Southern Democrats. Mm. And so Father Hesper said when Johnson finally decided to do, to, to do it, what he did was he collected information on all these Southern Democrats, um, the kind of mistresses they had, the kind, you know, which hotels they went, he got intelligence agents to collect all the information. Call up each guy in the middle of the night at 2 a.m. or so when they were in the hotel room with someone other than his wife. <laughs> now, to, now you, you know, I want you to, 
to 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 vote for my bill. Father Hesper talks about this story all the time, to, and it's not today. The U.S. Johnson. <laughs> And so, so eventually, he eventually the civil rights bill was passed because Johnson arm twisted all the Southern Democrats. So I don't know, but you know, I don't think Father Hesburgh lies. So I, so to, so probably it's a it's a credible story. Could be. Um, but at the same time, we also know that in terms of American politics, it was very difficult to get Southern Democrats on board at the time. So, you know, you do have, even when, when you can mobilize a lot of support, still sometimes the obstacles can be pretty, pretty daunting. And so it is just, you know, it can a story of contingency. Um, and then another thing is that really affects this part, another control, just this part and rather than these two, these two part aspect is um, the, the democracy div dividend. Marshall talks about how actually when we have civil resistance, you're more likely to get um, economic growth, moderate to high economic growth. And we see that in Poland. Now earlier, um, Masha was talking about, you know, how in Russia, in Ukraine, because you don't see any democracy dividends, and therefore people feel disillusioned, right? I also have a, I think you mentioned Ukraine, but I also, I also have a very good friend from Ukraine. She now works in Hong Kong. She said, I can't bear going back to Ukraine. The, the whole country is insane. Um, uh, it's, in a, it's a mess. And I can say that I don't really agree with this view, but a lot of Chinese, they also look at, look at Russia, look at, you know, the breakup of the Soviet Union. They look at the Russian economy. They look at a lot of these other economies. And they look at, for example, other democracies in Asia. They say, you know, look at the Philippines. They had, they had a people, a people revolution, and see what happened to the economy. And they say, look at Thailand, and look, look at what a mess they, had, they, they are in. Now, I don't agree with this view, but the fact that, that because so many Chinese share this view, that you know we have economic growth. I mean, of course, we know a lot of losers. Early, early this morning, we talk about peasants, workers. These are losers, in under the China model. But there are a lot of winners who say, you know. Look at them. Democracy is a nice thing, but it doesn't really fill my stomach. Therefore, it's OK. And this is scary because not just Chinese are thinking that. And you know, even when I, I don't agree with this view, but if enough, enough of Chinese who share this view, and they're also spreading this view. It is so sad because China has money now, so it is giving money to African countries, to Nepal, to all these, um, and to all these um, Asian countries as well. And so they're spreading the China model. Now, this is another piece of geopolitics that you guys have to deal with, how to deal with Chinese money. Um, I guess, OK, 630. <laughs> <laughs> This, uh, uh, Nepal is one of the good examples uh, for the failure of 10 years long armed conflict, but the success of 19 days uh, people's resistance. It's a non-violent movement. <coughs> but what happened is even after the uh, movement complete, Democratization started, but transitional period is for longer, and the longer is became very long. So, my question is, what will be the <laughs> uh, crucial points? The transitional period can be shortened, and the democratization started for development change. But uh, if you see the examples. Because of the this uh, uh, within the uh, three, 365 days, more than 100 days, there is a demonstration. <laughs> always closed uh, all everything, general strikes, still going on. So, 
and many people who are normally not affiliated with the politics, they are quite fed up right now. So, uh, because of the decrease in, not development, but the decrease in economic situation, decrease in poverty, sorry, <laughs> increase in poverty everywhere. So, what would be the best strategy that uh, such type of uh, uh, things uh, end quickly, immediately, <laughs> and uh, the democratization system can emerge immediately. So what should be the crucial points? I suppose you're it's asking for me. It's for <laughs> everybody. It's <laughs> for <laughs> forum. Well, if, I, <laughs> well, if, I, if I knew an answer to your question, I would be a rich man. <laughs> um, but I think you are touching uh, an issue that um, I think it was also raised uh, earlier in the case of Ukraine. Uh, a kind of disappointment that is emerging uh, after the successful nonviolent resistance, and and then the perceptions that that nonviolent resistance doesn't deliver. Mm. And um, and I think that using uh, the, the the framework of my analysis, uh, in the same way, civil resistance generates certain social capital that is propitious for democratic transformation. In the same way, old system generates corrosive social capital mm. that exists still mm. when the civil resistance wins the struggle. So you've got two social capitals, one propitious, another corrosive, uh, standing kind of next to one another. So in the case, for example, I don't know exactly the Nepalese case, but uh, the, the Ukraine case, you've got this, the corrosive social capital generated by Kuchmis, by, by Leonid Kuchma, who was governing the country for a number of years. That was then, you know, uh, perhaps facing this, this more propitious capital generated by by Orange Revolution, uh, and um, and then we need to see, you know, how those social capitals are kind of uh, affecting one another, and which one is taking precedence over the other. I know that I haven't answered your question, but I said I would be a rich man if I know the answer. Um, just a quick point about your politics is that even during the Cold War. Actually, you know, very often some countries didn't want to commit themselves to either the Soviet Union or the United States. <coughs> they play them against each other. So one thing a country like Nepal could do is to play India against China. <laughs> <laughs> Can I actually, uh, let's see, uh, I know that there are some people still who haven't asked any questions, and I know that there are people from the countries that went and that kind of experience a uh, successful nonviolent movement and democratization. And I wanted actually to hear from those people. I know that Fatima, you are from Maldives. Mm -hmm. uh, you, your country actually experienced a, a successful nonviolent uh, movement or the, the outcome of, of the, of, of the, of the nonviolent movement, which was successful. Mm -hmm. And your country embarked on the democratization process. Uh, how do you see that democratization, whether that democratization process is influenced, and if, if so, in what way, by what happened you know, before that democratization started? Um, my country's situation is quite unique because it's uh, only 300,000 people. So uh, even with the, democra the democratization movement that came in was also led by an elite that was somehow dissatisfied with the um, former regime. Uh, so since after the transition, since after we had the new government, uh, the grievances of the public are still not being dealt with as um, effectively as possible. So uh, workers, workers unions still don't have the proper legislation to function. Uh, women's rights issues are still there. The judiciary is still, um, the judiciary is, it's interesting because the judiciary is still under the power of the old judges that were nominated. Yeah, Similar like Nepal. Nominated <laughs> under the former uh, regime. So the judiciary sides with the one one party, the party that was in power before, 
and uh, the civil service was manned by people from the former regime. And so they are still there. The civil service doesn't cooperate with the current government. Judiciary sort of does everything it can to um, make sure that the current government, people in the current government aren't able to uh, do things the way that they want it to happen. And unfortunately, right after we had the transition, we had we all had our first parliamentary election, first democratic parliamentary election, and the form, uh, the party that was in in power previously, got a majority in the parliamentary elections. So our case is uh, different because the 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 reform movement on were only able to have get like fifty four percent of the vote. So the former government still had forty four solid like percentages. Um, we are into like the second year of the new government, so it, we're still sort of trying to sort out where it's going. At least the dem democratic process is ongoing, right? Sorry. The democracy is working. Uh, depends. Uh, mm. It's interesting <laughs> that you took. No, it's interesting that you took the role of uh, religion in democratic movements because in our case, the religious conservative uh, <coughs> groups operating within the reform, reform movement have sort of uh, really started using the freedoms to be not free. Mm -hmm. For example, mm -hmm. right now we are debating whether or not um, the president is sort of holding back making into law the religious unity regulation that was brought in by the Adalat party. And it's we're just sort of holding our breath to see what will happen because our constitution is not secular. It's, it's an Islamic constitution which means that uh, like very arbitrary laws can be made under the name of Islam. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, I, I, I won't say that our movement is successful yet. I, I, I hope that it becomes. Mm -hmm. But by, I would say that by 2013 we will be able to tell. <laughs> you know, it's 2010, so it's it's 20 years after Poland's transition when I could talk about all those factors, not earlier. For me, like democracy can't come without justice, and the majority like the tyranny of the majority is not justice. Okay, uh, my question is uh, to Victoria. Uh, wow. Oh, okay, sorry. sorry. Uh, my question is to Victoria. Uh, I would like to know whether, uh, uh, why uh, there is no effective uh, civil resistance and uh, massive mobilization in China. Is it, it, can it be attributed to economic uh, development or the effectiveness of the disruptive measure of the Chinese government? Which one is the most important? Um, I would say that in the Chinese case, now I, actually we have to separate Hong Kong and Taiwan from mainland China because Hong Kong is a totally different story. So in mainland China, I would say that the state is just very overwhelming and it also uses divide and rule strategies. So for example, there, there are these workers and peasants demonstrating all the time, mm -hmm. but so long, but they, they are taught, these protests are, are, are tolerated so long as you know, you don't make connections. Even, for example, different branches of Honda, you don't make connection. You just restrain, restrict yourself to you know, workers from this particular factory. Mm. Demonstrate, get together and demonstrate against your own management. Mm. Don't get together with um, Honda, uh, another Honda, Honda branch two hours away. Mm. Then it is okay. Mm. And that is important because then, then workers and peasants, these people are atomized. And at the same time, the post-Tenerman social bargain, you make money but shut mm. up, has mm. been very effective. Um, and so all these winners mm. of this China model, then basically they're happy. Yeah. And they really literally tell me, you know, what's wrong with you? Why are you foreigners? They keep talking about these issues. We're happy. 
stay, you know, leave us alone. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you look at Hong Kong because we have freedom so far up, so and we, up to now we have freedom. So people demonstrate on the street a lot. Civil society is very vibrant, and um, there are all kinds of things going on. So it's, it's a very different story. Mm -hmm. Taiwan the same. So uh, very vibrant civil society. If there is space to organize, mm -hmm. and it's in China, it's not that I. I I would not say that you know that you cannot expand the space, but it is very difficult. And so far, the people who are the most motivated to do so at huge cost to themselves mm -hmm. are these Protestant vice defense lawyers. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I would like to say that uh, in Guinea, we are also in a uh, a transitional period, and we will have our uh, say presidential election in this coming Sunday, so the next Sunday. And um, we had in 2009 a military junta. Uh, they seized the pub, and they killed more than 115 non-violent activists. Yeah, but. Things are changing. That's good. My question is this. Uh, the Catholic event, Catholic event uh, for this change was, say, this massive killing of people. And now we will have our election. And it, it will be good for our country, you know, to keep pressure, nonviolent action. And I don't know how to sustain it. Non-violent action. If you don't have, say, a strong Catholic event, as we explained here, this is my first question. The second is this one: Do you have any example uh, where the civil resistance failed, say, to build or to consolidate uh, any democratic transition? And can you let us know what was the, what uh, were the main reasons? for that. And I have, I have seen many statistical data here. I'm a statistician also. <laughs> I, I wonder, I don't know if you did any statistical tests uh, when you make comparison between mm -hmm. results you found from uh, bottom up and top down uh, data. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, both questions are very difficult. Um, Catholic, catalytic events. Um, um, we talk about probably in various stages of the of, of the movement mobilizations. One can identify various catalytic events, and we talk about backfire, uh, the uh, the killings of the 115 or so nonviolent resistors on the study uh, would could have generated that kind of backfire and. Could have been a catalytic event for yeah. the mobilization of the movement, and I am not probably in the position, not knowing the the situational context of of your country, to say why it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. I think you are the best person to answer mm -hmm. why exactly mm -hmm. this kind of uh, massacre. I know why. So what? Why? I know why. <laughs> but, but that's not that's not my question. Uh -huh. My question is now: we are we are getting what you would like to get, you know, transitional democracy. But now, after this election, how to sustain our civil action, you know, to keep ongoing okay. our democracy? That's my Okay, um, my answer would be the best people, those activists, should not be, or half of them should stay in the civil society sector and half of them should go to the government. Why? If you send 100% of those activists to the government, you will have a situation that you have in Georgia. Uh, most of those people who are activists involved in bringing down Shevardnadze regime, they became part of the government and there was no one left to check them, to check on them. So, um, in the Polish case, uh, a number of intellectuals became uh, entered the, the parliament and, 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 and then became ministers 
and then implemented different reforms. But for example, one of the major intellectual leaders of the movement, Adam Michnik, he became a parliamentarian, but then uh, kind of quickly uh, left the politics. And before actually he became a parliamentarian in that uh, during the election campaign uh, uh, in June, for the June 1989 elections, he established the, uh, the daily newspaper called Gazeta Wyborcza, which is right now the largest daily in Poland with a very, actually decentralized with a number of local offices. My advice would be probably for, for you and your colleagues to set up those instruments and institutions that could provide a, a kind of check on the government. And that would be probably media. I think that uh, Adam Michnik, by establishing Gazeta Wyborcza, he did more for democracy mm -hmm. than yeah. why, why he would kind of enter the government and, 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 and do something there. Mm -hmm. Because the Gazeta Wyborcza is essentially, well, and, and in addition to different other newspapers, is controlling the government. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. Victoria, yeah. do you want to well, respond? Well, this is the second part of his question. Yeah. Which is, uh, you know, what are the key reasons for significant failure in civil resistance campaign? Well, unity, planning, non-violent discipline. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I can say a little bit from the past. Uh, over the last like few years, we have been in civil resistance and like uh, uh, development agencies and media have been saying a very good in uh, creating that environment. But one of the challenges that we are facing is like we are creating a pool of people who are demanding for rights but who are not aware of the, what are the responsibilities as a citizen. So uh, if we are only creating a people's for rights and then there's no counter uh, counterbalance from the government to check like uh, uh, whether the rights are established, whether the responsibilities are fulfilled by people or not. And that's, um, um, that's where like we are in between. Because the civil resistance has created awareness of for uh, awareness in terms of like what are the rights, what are the political rights, what are human rights. But we are still in the position like to find out where is the break even point. Uh, uh, to uh, start an actual practice of both the activities. <coughs> and uh, the geopolitics is also like uh, strange in our countries. China India, Pakistan, US, every of these countries are interested <laughs> to watch the politics of the other countries. So we are always, uh, the government changes very often in our countries. I think if you are aware of it, we had 11 governments in past few years. Um, in this condition, um, uh, where uh, the government is always changing and we are creating of this, I think, uh, it would have been better, and I think uh, from this uh, uh, slides, I can see a little bit of light. I think we are still building a block, uh, but we are not sure like where we are heading to. But the resistance, uh, as seen in many, many of the countries, I think it takes a lot of uh, time to get into a, a certain threshold. Yes. Uh, one of the arguments is that civil um, civil resistance probably in Poland and in, in other countries where it took longer to develop and, and actually exist was much more beneficial for democracy. So the longer civil resistance mm. Mm. Uh, with where people have time to establish those <coughs> alternative institutions and mm. educate uh, people in self-governance mm -hmm. underground, mm. the actually the better for the transition later. It's ironic. I, because you know it, that means that you have to struggle more, uh, and that you have to str uh, suffer longer, uh, in order for those outcomes perhaps to to be more more kind of democratic. Uh, and I don't know whether this is actually uh, true, uh, but this is kind of a common sense looking at all those. Uh, no, other than to say that, sorry, um, Marshall's argument is very smart because he defines civil resistance not just in terms of protests and all these other activities, but in terms of institutions. Mm -hmm. That's key. To some extent, you're presenting a standard Huntington argument. He argued several decades ago that actually there are a lot of societies experience disorder um, precisely because you just don't have enough channels to take care of people's aspirations. 
when when your when people's demands and aspirations overwhelm institutional channels, then you do actually can still get um, disorder. And this is actually the number one Chinese fear. Mm. You have democracy, you have chaos. Just look at you know again look at all these other countries, and this is what they believe in. <laughs> <laughs>